Oh, hey, you're up there. Hi, I'm Ryan. Welcome back to Breakdown. Today, we are making this. And Doctor Who has been a love of mine for many years now, and I love the TARDIS materialization effect. More specifically, the one that they do in the 2005 series. The way that they do it in the 2005 series is a little bit different from the way that they did it in the classic series. Their technologies come a little bit further and they can spice it up a little bit. And I just really wanted to break down how they did it. So first and foremost, I would like to emphasize that this is not a tutorial. If you are here to learn how to do this, you might be able to follow along and learn bits and pieces, but it's not intended as a tutorial. This is me figuring out how they did the effect and recreating it myself. All right, so let's get started. So the first thing I did was take my camera out into the car park and just film a plate. I knew roughly where the TARDIS was going to land, so I just pointed my camera at that spot and just walked around it. You also notice that the footage is very shaky and that's because I want to challenge myself. So after I filmed that plate, I moved my car into the car park and I filmed my car in the same spot. The reason being, I wanted reference for the shadows. Okay, so today I am working in Nuke, which is a 3D compositing program. It has some really good tracking features that I can export into the 3D program, and it is the industry standard program for this kind of thing. The first thing I do want to do is just bring in my footage, and then I need to undistort everything. Every lens has a little bit of a distortion to it and the 3D tracking and everything doesn't know how to work that out. 3D models are made 100% perfect. A straight line is a straight line, a circle is a circle, but that's not the case in reality. So in order to get a better track, we first have to make our footage a little bit more perfect and that is removing the lens distortion. Then once everything is composited, at the very end of the project, we'll put that lens distortion back on. So what I wanna do for this is just find things in the scene that should be straight. So that wall there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put markers along it there. So now Nuke is gonna analyze those lines and work out the lens distortion from there and make the image as flat as it possibly can. Cool. So now that that's done, I can start doing a 3D track of the scene. So for that, we want to do a camera tracker node and just set in that we've got no distortion. It's free camera and just hit track. And Nuke is going to find a bunch of tracking points to latch onto. So from all of those tracking markers, Nuke is gonna assess them and work out how the camera moves in that space and it's gonna replicate that in 3D. So this is what the trackers look like in 3D space and I just wanna put in a rectangle so that I can roughly line up where the TARDIS needs to be and make sure that it is a good track before I export it into the 3D program. All right, that's looking pretty good. So now I'm gonna bring it into my 3D modeling program of choice, which happens to be Autodesk Maya. So here's the model of the TARDIS that I made in 2014 um, when I was studying. This is Maya default lighting, and this is what it looks like when you don't touch anything. Okay, it also looks like the bump map is broken, so I'm gonna have to fix that up. So because I filmed this outside, I can cheat a little bit. Maya has something called a skybox, which I can just throw in. With this, I can set time of day, sun position and everything. So I'm just gonna make it a little bit warmer to match the scene. So I've got my reference up. I'm just gonna tweak it a little bit more to match the shadow. Yep. Okay, that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. 
Okay, so I've added the bump map now to the doors and you can see the difference that it makes. Bump map essentially is fake depth. If you were to model all of the imperfections in something like a tarmac ground or a piece of wood, not only would it take forever to model, but it's all gonna be very labor intensive for the computer. So instead you put a black and white texture on the model and that tells the computer that the black parts are lowered, the white parts are raised, and that gives you all of this great detail without wrecking your computer. All right, there we go. That is the model ready to render. So in the show, the light on the TARDIS glows as it materializes. And I really want to do that as well. The light's going to shine off of the model. It's going to shine off of the ground. There's going to be some drop off. So I'm going to have to render a lighting pass out of the scene at the same time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this up in a separate render pass. So in a studio, every task is done by a different person. So someone's going to make the models. Someone different is going to texture the model. Someone different is going to light the scene. Someone else is going to animate everything. And then a completely different person, again, will put everything together. So when you render everything, even with this scene, you render everything in something called passes. And that will give you a different pass for the texture. That will give you a different pass for the light, which is called a specular pass. It will give you a different pass for the shadows. It will give you a different path for the motion blur. And then the compositor will look at everything when they've got it and they can make tweaks from there. So say something looks too shiny, you can turn the shininess on something down without waiting X amount of hours for the scene to re-render and it saves a lot of time in a production pipeline. Ooh. So I've just put the light in the scene and it's reacting with the model in a way that I wasn't expecting. I'm getting some really nice light fall off on the pillars and some of the indents and the doors. I really like that. In the show, you can see like the outline of everything coming in before the actual color fades into the scene. And I think that's how I'm gonna do it. I like that. Okay, so I've deleted a couple of faces of the model and now there's nothing to catch the other bits in the back. Now, they probably wouldn't delete parts of the model for the show to get that effect if that's how they did it. They probably have a like trick up their sleeve that I don't know about. Now I could spend the next hour playing with texture settings and setting something up to get this effect without having to delete everything, but everything is on a deadline and I've just fixed this within five minutes. It's gonna give me the result that I want and if anything goes wrong, I can revert back to an old save before I started deleting stuff. Did you know that 51% of people that have been watching the videos on ImageFlex are not subscribed? And that's a lot. If everyone who watched the videos hit the subscribe button, our audience would double. And that's really cool. If you enjoy this content, if you enjoy Breakdown, if you enjoy the short films, if you enjoy ImageFlex props, if you hit that subscribe button, it's the support I need to be able to do it more frequently. So I'm back in Nuke, I've opened up a new comp, um, I don't need any of the 3D tracking stuff at this stage, but I have kept it in a separate file just in case I need to refer back to it later. I just want to talk a little bit more about Nuke and how Nuke does everything just a little bit differently to After Effects. So After Effects will stack all of its layers and you can choose how each layer interacts with everything. You can set it to screen, you can set alphas and everything. Nuke does the same thing, but it uses something called nodes. And the Nuke workspace is a super large area that you can pan around and zoom in and out of. You can set up massive compositions in here. Whereas in After Effects, like you can do the same thing, but it's all in a single timeline. So when I finish this, I'll go and roughly set up this project in After Effects, just so you can see the difference between my final Nuke workspace and an After Effects timeline. Nuke is also very specific to the compositing of 3D models. There is a lot of flexibility to it and a lot of ease of use features that it has. And that's why it's the industry standard. Okay, so all of my layers are now set up and I need to make the TARDIS fade in. But I don't want to just make it fade in. That's boring. So what I'm going to do is use the rotoscope tool to draw a cutout. Roto node. 
That's roughly the shape I want. And uh, now I'm just gonna have to animate that. This is another one of those things. I'm sure that they have a fancy way of doing it within the 3D modeling program. I'm sure there's a way to animate the textures in the manner that I'm trying to do. I had a real quick look online, but I couldn't find anything. At the end of the day, I know I can smash it out this way in 20 minutes. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, all right, so we're nearly done. I just wanna add a few more bits and pieces. First of which is going to be a dust element. When you can make a fake object interact with the environment in any way, it's really gonna help marry it to the scene. All right, lucky last. You'll notice that the light is completely blown out. If you look at any light, you, you know that it flares. It doesn't just look like a cutout, a bright white cutout of that object. And something like this can make or break a scene. Okay, so to make this a little bit easier for me, I'm just gonna set up a tracker and I'm going to track the light. Now I'll apply that to my flare. Cool, cool. And I'm just gonna animate the opacity to fade in and out where I need it to. All right, I said that was the last thing, but I forgot that we need to color correct. Um, oh yeah, okay. I forgot that Americans misspelled the word color. Just tweak the saturation and contrast, bring a little bit of life back into it. Uh, filmmakers will normally film things in a setting called log, which is just a really flat desaturated image. And that just gives you the most amount of control over the colors later on in post-production. And now we wait for that to render. All right, there we have it. That is the breakdown and recreation of the TARDIS materializing effect from Doctor Who. Um, I'm going to start doing a little bit more breakdown stuff like this. If there's an effect that you'd like to see me try and recreate, leave it in the comments below. I'll do my very best. If you liked this video, let me know by hitting the like button. If you dislike this video, leave a comment letting me know how I can improve. And please, if you like any of my content at all, hit the subscribe button, hit the little bell notification help me get the channel out there. I really want to grow the audience a little bit more this year and all of those things will help me out immensely. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Breakdown. I will see you next time.